The Compart 1 By Aristotle Audiobook 12x44 Then the premise DB must remain unchanged, but the quality of AD must be changed, so that DB is always true, AD always false. Such error is practically identical with that which is inferred through the appropriate middle. On the other hand, B, if the conclusion is not inferred through the appropriate middle, I, when the middle is subordinate to a but is predicable of no B, both premises must be false, because if there is to be a conclusion both must be posited as asserting the contrary of what is actually the fact, and so posited both become false. E.g. Suppose that actually all D is a but no B is D, then if these premises are changed in quality, a conclusion will follow and both of the new premises will be false. When, however, too, the middle D is not subordinate to A, A D will be true, D B false A D true because A was not subordinate to D, D B false because if it had been true, the conclusion to would have been true, but itis ex hypothesi false. When Theronius inference is in the second figure, both premises cannot be entirely false, since if B is subordinate to A, there can be no middle predicable of all of one extreme and of none of the other, as was stated before. One premise, however, may be false, and it may be either of actually an attribute is assumed to be and not of B, false. Or again if attributable to B B be true, C A false. We have stated what kinds of prem in cases where the is negative. If affirmative, a, I through the aprop this case both prem since, as we say remain unchanged conclusion, and see quality of wishes posterior analytics, book 2 translated bg. r. g. Mere the kinds of question we ask are as many as the kinds of things which we know. The hour in fact for one whether the connection of an attribute with the thing is a fact, 2, what is the reason of the connection, 3, whether a thing exists, 4, what is the nature of the thing. Thus, when our question concerns a complex of thing and attribute and we ask whether the thing is thus or otherwise qualified whether, e.g., the sun suffers eclipse or not then we are asking us to the fact of a connection. That our inquiry ceases with the discovery that the sun does suffer eclipse is an indication of these, and if we know from the start that the sun suffers eclipse, we do not inquire whether it does so or not. On the other hand, when we know the fact we ask the reason, as, for example, when we know that the sun is being eclipsed and that an earthquake is in progress, it is the reason of eclipse or earthquake into which we inquire. Where a complex is concerned, then, those are the two questions we ask, but for some objects of inquiry we have a different kind of question to ask, such as whether there is or is not a centaur or a god. By is or is not I mean is or is not, without further qualification, as opposed to is or is not e.g. white. On the other hand, when we have ascertained the thing's existence, we inquire as to its nature, asking, for instance, what, then, is God, or what is man? These, then, are the four kinds of question we ask, and it is in the answers to these questions that our knowledge consists. Now when we ask whether a connection is a fact, or whether a thing without qualification is, we are really asking whether the connection or the thing has a middle, and when we have ascertained either that the conic is a fact or that the thing is i.e. Ascertained either the partial or the unqualified being of the thing and are proceeding to ask the reason of the connection or the nature of the thing, then we are asking what the middle is. By distinguishing the fact of the connection and the existence of the thing as respectively the partial and the unqualified being of the thing, I mean that if we ask does the moon suffer eclipse, or does the moon wax, the question concerns a part of the thing's being for what we are asking in such questions is whether a thing is this or that, i.e. has or has not this or that attribute. Whereas, if we ask whether the moon or night exists, the question concerns the unqualified being of a thing. 
we conclude that in all our inquiries we are asking either whether there is a middle or what the middle is. For the middle here is precise life cause, and it is the cause that we seek in all our inquiries. Thus, does the moon suffer eclipse, means is there or is there not a cause producing eclipse oft moon, and when we have learnt that there is, our next question is, what, then, is this cause? For the cause through which a thing is not is this or that, i.e. has this or that attribute, but without qualification is and the cause through which it is not is without qualification, but is this or that is having some essential attribute or some accident are both alike the middle. By that which is without qualification I mean the subject, e.g. moon or earth or sun or triangle, by that wicca subjectes, in the partial sense, I mean a property, e.g. eclipse, equality or inequality, interposition or non-interposition. For in all these examples it is clear that the nature of the thing and the reason of the fact are identical. The question what is eclipse, and its answer the privation of the moon's light by the interposition of earth are identical with the question what is the reason of eclipse, or why does the moon suffer eclipse? and the reply because of the failure of light through the earth's shutting it out. Again, for what is a concord? A commensurate numerical ratio of a high and a low note, we may substitute what ratio makes a high and a low note concordant? Their relation according to a commensurate numerical ratio. Are the high and the low note concordant, is equivalent to is their ratio commensurate, and when we find that it is commensurate, we ask what, then, is their ratio. Cases in which the middle is sensible show that the object of our inquiry is always the middle. We inquire, because we have not perceived it, whether there is or is not a middle causing, e.g. an eclipse. On the other hand, if we were on the moon we should not be inquiring either as to the fact or the reason, but both fact and reason would be obvious simultaneously. For the act of perception would have enabled us to know the universal too, since, the present fact of an eclipse being evident, perception would then at the same time give us the present fact of the earth screening the sun's light, and from this would arise the universal. Thus, as we maintain, to know a thing's nature is to know the reason why it is, and this is equally true of things in so far as they are said without qualification to he as opposed to being possessed of some attribute, and in so far as they are said to be possessed of some attribute such as equal to right angles, or greater or less. It is clear, then, that all questions are a search for a middle. Let us now state how essential nature is revealed and in what way it can be reduced to demonstration, what definition is and what things are definable. And let us first discuss certain difficulties which these questions raise, beginning which we have to say with a point most intimately connected with our immediately preceding remarks, name life doubt that might be felt as to whether or not it is possible to know the same thing in the same relation, both by definition and by demonstration. It might, I mean, be urged that definition is held to concern essential nature and is in every case universal and affirmative, whereas, on the other hand, some conclusions are negative and some are not universal, e.g. All in the second figure are negative, none in the third are universal. And again, not even all affirmative conclusions in the first figure are definable, e.g. Every triangle has its angles equal to two right angles. An argument proving this difference between demonstration and definition is that to have scientific knowledge of the demonstrable is identical with possessing a demonstration of it. Hence if demonstration of such conclusions as these is possible, there clearly cannot also be definition of them. If there could, one might know such a conclusion also in virtue of its definition without possessing the demonstration of it, for there is nothing to stop our having the one without the other. Induction too will sufficiently convince us of this difference, for never yet by defining anything essential attribute or accident did we get knowledge of it. Again, if to define is to acquire knowledge of a substance, at any rate such attributes are not substances. It is evident, then, 
that not everything demonstrable can be defined. What then? Can everything definable be demonstrated, or not? There is one of our previous arguments which covers this too. Of a single thing qua single there is a single scientific knowledge. Hence, since to know the demonstrable scientifically is to possess the demonstration of it, an impossible consequence will follow possession of its definition without its demonstration will give knowledge of the demonstrable. Moreover, the basic premises of demonstrations are definitions, and it has already been shown that these will be found indemonstrable, either the basic premises will be demonstrable and will depend on prior premises, and the regress will be endless, or the primary truths will be indemonstrable definitions. But if the definable and the demonstrable are not wholly the same, may they yet be partial life same? Or is that impossible, because there can be no demonstration of the definable? There can be none, because definition is of the essential nature or being of something, and all demonstrations evidently posit and assume the essential nature mathematical demonstrations, for example, the nature of unit and the odd, and all the other sciences likewise. Moreover, every demonstration proves a predicate of a subject as attaching or as not attaching to it, but in definition one thing is not predicated of another, we do not, e.g. predicate animal of biped nor biped of animal nor yet figure of plain plain not being figure nor figure plain. Again, to prove essential nature is not the same as to prove the fact of a connection. Now definition reveals essential nature, demonstration reveals that a given attribute attaches or does not attach to a given subject, but different things require different demonstrations unless the one demonstration is related to the other as part to whole. I add this because if all triangles have been proved to possess angles equal to two right angles, then this attribute has been proved to attach to isosceles, for isosceles is a part of which all triangles constitute the whole. But in the case before us the fact and the essential nature are not so related to one another, since the one is not a pertoft other. So item ergs thought natal the definable is demonstrable nor all the demonstrable definable and we may draw the general conclusion that there is no identical object of which it is possible to possess both a definition and a demonstration. It follows obviously that definition and demonstration are neither identical nor contained either within the other. If they were, their objects would be related either as identical or as whole and part. So much, then, for the first stage of our problem. The next step is to raise the question whether syllogism i.e. demonstration of the definable nature is possible or, as our recent argument assumed, impossible. We might argue it impossible on the following grounds a, syllogism proves an attribute of a subject through the middle term, on the other hand, b, its definable nature is both peculiar to a subject and predicated of it as belonging to its essence. But in that case, 1. The subject, its definition, and the middle term connecting them must be reciprocally predicable of one another, for if A is to C, obviously A is peculiar to B and B to C in fact all three terms are peculiar to one another. And further, 2. If A inheres in the essence of all B and B is predicated universally of all C as belonging to C's essence, also must be predicated of C as belonging to its essence. If one does not take this relation as thus duplicated if, that is, A is predicated as being of the essence of B, but bis no toft essence oft subjects of which it is predicated A will not necessarily be predicated of C as belonging to its essence. So both premises will predicate essence, and consequently B also will be predicated of C as its essence. Since, therefore, both premises do predicate essence I.E. Definable form CS definable form will appear in the middle term before the conclusion is drawn. We may generalize by supposing that it is possible to prove the essential nature of man. Let C be man, a man's essential nature two-footed animal, or aught else it may be. Then, if we are to syllogize a must be predicated of all B. But this premise will be mediated by a fresh definition 
which consequently will also be the essential nature of man. Therefore the argument assumes what it has to prove, since B2 is the essential nature of man. It is, however, the case in which there are only the two premises i.e. in which the premises are primary and immediate which we ought to investigate, because it best illustrates the point under discussion. Thus they who prove the essential nature of soul or man or anything else through reciprocating terms beg the question. It would be begging the question, for example, to contend that the soul is that which causes its own life, and that what causes its own life is a self-moving number, for one would have to postulate that the soul is a self-moving number in the sense of being identical with it. For if A is predicable as a mere consequent of B and B of C, A will not on that account be the definable form of C. A will merely be what it was true to say of C. Even if A is predicated of all B inasmuch as B is identical with a species of A, still it will not follow. Being an animal is predicated of being a man since it is true that in all instances to be human is to be animal, just as it is also true that every man is an animal but not as identical with being man. We conclude, then, that unless one takes both the premises as predicating essence, one cannot infer that A is the definable form and essence of C. But if one does so take them, in assuming B one will have assumed, before drawing the conclusion, what the definable form of C is, so that there has been no inference, for one has begged the question. Nor, as was said in my formal logic, is the method of division a process of inference at all, since at no point does the characterization of subject follow necessarily from the premising of certain other facts. Division demonstrates as little as does induction. For in a genuine demonstration the conclusion must not be put as a question nor depend on a concession, but must follow necessarily from its premises, even if the respondent deny it. The definer asks is man animal or inanimate, and then assumes he has not inferred that man is animal. Next, when presented with an exhaustive division of animal into terrestrial and aquatic, he assumes that man is terrestrial. Moreover, that man is the complete formula, terrestrial animal, does not follow necessarily from the premises. This too is an assumption, and equally an assumption whether the division comprises many differentia or few. Indeed as this method of division is used by those who proceed by it, even truths that can be inferred actually fail to appear as such. For why should not the whole of this formula be true of man, and yet no texabithi's essential nature or definable form? Again, what guarantee is there against an unessential addition, or against the omission of the final or of an intermediate determinant of the substantial being? The champion of division might here urge that though these lapses do occur, yet we can solve that difficulty if all the attributes we assume are constituents of the definable form, and if, postulating the genus, we produce by division the requisite uninterrupted sequence of terms, and omit nothing, and that indeed we cannot fail to fulfill these conditions if what is to be divided falls whole into the division at each stage, and none of it is omitted, and that this the dividenda must without. Further question b, ultimately, incapable of fresh specific division. Nevertheless, we reply, division does not involve inference, if it gives knowledge, it gives it in another way. Nor is there any absurdity in this. Induction, perhaps, is not demonstration any more than is division, e.t. it does make evident some truth. Yet to state a definition reached by division is not to state a conclusion. As, when conclusions are drawn without their appropriate middles, the alleged necessity by which the inference follows from the premises is open to a caestionis to the reason for it, so definitions reached by division invite the same question. Thus to the question what is the essential nature of man, the divider replies animal, mortal, footed, biped, wingless, and when at each step he is asked why, he will say, and, as he thinks, proves by division that all animal is mortal or immortal. But such a formula taken in its entirety is not definition, 
so that even if division does demonstrate its formula, definition at any rate does not turn out to be a conclusion of inference. Can we nevertheless actually demonstrate what a thing essentially and substantially is, but hypothetically, i.e. by premising, 1, that its definable form is constituted by the peculiar attributes of its essential nature, 2, that such and such are the only attributes of its essential nature, and that the complete synthesis of them is peculiar to the thing, and thus since in this synthesis consists the being of the thing obtaining our conclusion? Or is the truth that, since proof must be through the middle term, the definable form is once more assumed in these minor premise too? Further, just as in syllogizing we do not premise what syllogistic inference is, since the premises from which we conclude must be related as whole and part, so the definable form must not fall within the syllogism but remain outside the premises posited. Itis own lie against a doubt as to its having been a syllogistic inference at all that we have to defend our argument as conforming to the definition of syllogism. It is only when someone doubts whether the conclusion proved is the definable form that we have to defend it as conforming to the definition of definable form which we assumed. Hence syllogistic inference must be possible even without the express statement of what syllogism is or what definable form is. The following type of hypothetical proof also begs the question. If evil is definable as the divisible, and the definition of a thing's contrary if it has won the contrary of the thing's definition, then, if good is the contrary of evil and the indivisible of the divisible, we conclude thought o be good is essential light o be indivisible. The question is begged because definable form is assumed as a premise, and as a premise which is to prove definable form. But not the same definable form, you may object. That I admit, for in demonstrations also we premise that this is predicable of that, but in this premise the term we assert of the minor is neither the major itself nor a term identical in definition, or convertible, with th major. Again, both proof by division and the syllogism just described are open to the question why man should be animal biped terrestrial and not merely animal and terrestrial since what they premise does not ensure that the predicates shall constitute a genuine unit and not merely belong to a single subject as do musical and grammatical when predicated of the same man. How then by definition shall we prove substance or essential nature? We cannot show it as a fresh fact necessarily following from the assumption of premises admitted to be facts the method of demonstration. We may not proceed as by induction to establish a universal on the evidence of groups of particulars which offer no exception, because induction proves not what the essential nature of a thing is but that it has or has not some attribute. Therefore, since presumably one cannot prove essential nature by an appeal to sense perception or by pointing with finger, what other method remains? To put it another way. How shall we by definition prove essential nature? He who knows what human or any other nature is, must know also that man exists, for no one knows the nature of what does not exist one can know the meaning of the phrase or name goat stag but not what the essential nature of a goat stag is. But further, if definition can prove what is the essential nature of a thing, can it also prove that it exists? And how will it prove them both by the same process? since definition exhibits one single thing and demonstration another single thing, and what human nature is and the fact that man exists are not the same thing. Then too we hold that it is by demonstration that the being of everything must be proved unless indeed to be were its essence, and, since being is not a genus, it is not the essence of anything. Hence the being of anything as fact is matter for demonstration, and this is the actual procedure of the sciences for the geometer assumes the meaning of the word triangle, but that it is possessed of some attribute he proves. What is it, then, that we shall prove in defining essential nature? Triangle? In that case a man will know by definition what a thing's nature is without knowing whether it exists. But that is impossible. Moreover it is clear, if we consider the methods of defining actually in use, that definition does not prove that the thing defined exists. 
since even if there does actually exist something which is equidistant from a center, yet why should the thing named in the definition exist? Why, in other words, should this be the formula defining circle? One might equally well call it the definition of mountain copper. Four definitions do not carry a further guarantee that the thing defined can exist or that it is what they claim to define. One can always ask why. Since, therefore, to define is to prove either a thing's essential nature or the meaning of its name, we may conclude that definition, if it in no sense proves essential nature, is a set of words signifying precisely what a name signifies. But that were a strange consequence, for, 1, both what is not substance and what does not exist at all would be definable, since even non-existence can be signified by a name. 2, all sets of words or sentences would be definitions, since any kind of sentence could be given a name, so that we should all be talking in definitions, an event Iliad would be a definition. 3, no demonstration can prove that any particular name means any particular thing. Neither, therefore, do definitions, in addition to revealing Thmin and Goff a name, also reveal that the name has this meaning. It appears then from these considerations that neither definition and syllogism nor their objects are identical, and further that definition neither demonstrates nor proves anything, and that knowledge of essential nature is not to be obtained either by definition or by demonstration. We must now start afresh and consider which of these conclusions are sound and which are not, and what is the nature of definition, and whether essential nature is in any sense demonstrable and definable or in an. Now to know its essential nature is, as we said, the same as to know the cause of a thing's existence, and the proof of this depends on the fact that a thing must have a cause. Moreover, this cause is either identical with the essential nature of the thing or distinct from it, and if its cause is distinct from it, the essential nature of the thing is either demonstrable or indemonstrable. Consequently, if the cause is distinct from the thing's essential nature and demonstration is possible, the cause must be the middle term, and, the conclusion proved being universal and affirmative, the proof is in the first figure. So the method just examined of proving it through another essential nature would be one way of proving essential nature, because a conclusion containing essential nature must be inferred through a middle which is an essential nature just as a peculiar property must be inferred through a middle which is a peculiar property, so that of the two definable natures of a single thing this method will prove one and not other. Now it was said before that this method could not amount to demonstration of essential nature it is actually a dialectical proof of it so let us begin again and explain by what method it can be demonstrated. When we are aware of a fact we seek its reason, and though sometimes the fact and the reason dawn on us simultaneously, yet we cannot apprehend the reason a moment sooner than the fact and clearly in just the same way we cannot apprehend a thing's definable form without apprehending that it exists, since while we are ignorant whether it exists we cannot know its essential nature. Moreover we are aware whether a thing exists or not sometimes through apprehending Ganila Mentanit's character, and sometimes accidentally, as, for example, when we are aware of thunder as a noise in the clouds, of eclipse as a privation of light, or of man as some species of animal, or of the soul as a self-moving thing. As often as we have accidental knowledge that the thing exists, we must be in a wholly negative state as regards awareness of its essential nature, for we have not got genuine knowledge even of its existence, and to search for a thing's essential nature when we are unaware that it exists is to search for nothing. On the other hand, Whenever we apprehend an element in the thing's character there is less difficulty. Thus it follows that the degree of our knowledge of a thing's essential nature is determined by the sense in which we are aware that it exists. Let us then take the following as our first instance of being aware of an element in the essential nature. Leto be eclipse, see the moon, be the earth's acting as a screen. Now to ask whether the moon is eclipsed or not is to ask whether or not B has occurred. But that is precisely the same as asking whether A has a defining condition, and if this condition actually exists, 
we assert that A also actually exists. Or again we may ask which side of a contradiction the defining condition necessitates. Does it make the angles of a triangle equal or not equal to two right angles? When we have found the answer, if the premises are immediate, we know fact and reason together, if they are not immediate, we know the fact without the reason, as in the following example. Let C be the moon, eclipse, bthe fact that the moon fails to produce shadows though she is full and though no visible body intervenes between us and her. Then if B, failure to produce shadows in spite of the absence of an intervening body, is attributable A to C, and eclipse, is attributable to B, it is clear that the moon is eclipsed, but the reason we is not yet clear, and we know that eclipse exists, but we do not know what its essential nature is. But when it is clear that A is attributable to C and we proceed to ask the reason of this fact, we are inquiring what is the nature of B. Is it the Earth's acting as a screen, or the Moon's rotation or her extinction? But B is the definition of the other term, viz. In these examples, of the major term A, for eclipse is constituted by the Earth acting as a screen. Thus, 1, what is thunder? The quenching goff fire in cloud, and, 2, why does it thunder? Because fire is quenched in the cloud, are equivalent. Let C be cloud, A thunder, B the quenching of fire. Then B is attributable to C, cloud, since fire is quenched in it, and A, noise, is attributable to B, and B is assuredly the definition of the major term A. If there be a further mediating cause of B, it will be one of the remaining partial definitions OFA. We have stated then how essential nature is discovered and becomes known, and we see that, while there is no syllogism I.E. No demonstrative syllogism of essential nature, yet it is through syllogism, viz. Demonstrative syllogism, that essential nature is exhibited. So we conclude that neither can the essential nature of anything which has a cause distinct from itself be known without demonstration, nor can it be demonstrated and this is what we contended in our preliminary discussions. Now while some things have a cause distinct from themselves, others have not. Hence it is evident that there are essential natures which are immediate, that is our basic premises, and of these not only that they are but also what they are must be assumed or revealed in some other way. This too is the actual procedure of the arithmetician, who assumes both the nature and the existence of unit. On the other hand, it is possible, in the manner explained, to exhibit through demonstration the essential nature of things which have a middle, i.e. a cause of their substantial being other than that being itself, but we do not there be demonstrated. Since definition is said to be the statement of a thing's nature, obviously one kind of definition will be a statement of the meaning of the name, or of an equivalent nominal formula. A definition in this sense tells you, e.g., the meaning of the phrase triangular character. When we are aware that triangle exists, we inquire the reason why it exists. But it is difficult thus to learn the definition of things the existence of which we do not genuinely know the cause of this difficulty being, as we said before, that we only know accidentally whether or not the thing exists. Audiobook generated by Read with the ears.